Ben Gifford, welcome to the podcast. How are you, buddy? I'm good. How are you, man? So good. So good to have you here. I think we need to start in the obvious place, and that is the recent 50-mile race you did over the weekend. White River, the classic Pacific Northwest 50-miler. Tell us how it went. It was really hot out there, man. Like, (laughs) really hot. And um, I originally had signed up to do it with a friend of mine who's training for Tour de Jean. And he was like, hey, man, we should do White River as like, because I need training for tour. And uh, it would be cool if we just like do it together and do it slow. I'm like, yeah, that sounds, that sounds like my speed. And then on Monday, the past Monday, he was like, um, hey, so I'm actually thinking about doing section J of the PCT. Do you want to do that instead? I'm like, you know, man, I don't have 75 unsupported miles in me <laughs> right now. I'm not, my training isn't there. He's like, oh, well, I think I'm going to do that. It's like, okay, great. Well, I guess I'm doing White River <laughs> this yeah. weekend. Um, but, you know, it, it went, um, it, it was not my finest performance at White River, but I think given the fact that it was over 90 um, and that I am a heavy sweater who does, who's never done well in the heat, I'm, I'm most proud of how I was able to manage my salts and fluids and nutrition, because that's always been a really difficult thing for me to, to manage when it starts to get hot. I, I, I'm a native Northwesterner. I don't do yeah. well in the heat. Yeah. And so it was a slow day out there, but I'm just really proud that I got it done, honestly. I bet there was carnage galore out there. I was thinking about you guys being just a few hours south here in Portland. It was brutally hot all weekend. I was thinking, man, it's tough conditions to push 50 miles in but and we should come back to talking about the section j because that's something that i'm looking at maybe tackling this summer and i heard from a little birdie that maybe you might be actually doing that later in the summer but we can yeah that's that's the plan i think i think our mutual friend uh ryan thrower and i are planning on making uh making a go at it uh yeah. hopefully in september so i'm i'm excited i've been wanting to do that for years and for me you know i get a, i have about 100 in my legs every year if that so you know, if I'm doing a hundred, that doesn't leave much room for a 70 plus mile push. Uh, it just, you know, it's like, it doesn't leave a lot of room for that. So, um, the fact that I wasn't able to do one this year kind of sets it up nicely. Yeah. Well, let's give some shine to Ryan Thrower because he's obviously our connective tissue. You and I don't know each other super well, but we have a bunch of mutual friends, including, the free trail MVP and the producer of this podcast, one of your good friends and training partners, Mr. Ryan Thrower. And you had the honor and responsibility to crew for him at the Bighorn 100 in June. So maybe tell the people about that adventure and more generally just kind of describe your guys' friendship. Yeah, well, the plan originally was that we would run it together and in some form or fashion, right? And I got COVID five, six weeks out from the race and the initial infection was totally manageable and fine. Just a couple of days on the couch, but I was really struggling, uh, once in the weeks after to get up to back into like an endurance, uh, endurance strength. I mean, I could go out for an hour, hour and a half around the neighborhood and be like, oh, I feel fine. And then I'd get three or four hours out in the mountains and just fall apart. And it culminated with a seven and a half hour attempt that I just completely ex- blew up on and yeah. my heart, my heart rate was like over a hundred for the last, for the hour after I got back to the car and I was like, all right, writing's on the wall, not safe. Um, but then a week later I felt completely fine. So, and I'd already pulled out of the race. I was like, well, let's just go out and crew Ryan. Cause Ryan's running. He has, uh, one dude, our friend David has like crewing and pacing. Uh, the course is an out and back for those who don't know it. And they had not figured out how they were going to get David out to pace and then how they're going to get the car back to the finish. <laughs> yeah. they, they, you know, they hadn't thought that far in advance, uh, which is admirable to a certain extent. Um, and so, you know, the, the, my friends who were going to crew me on the race, I just kind of reached out to them and, and I was like, do you want, you know, do you guys want to go out there anyways? And they're like, yes, we, I need, I need to get out of town, whatever, whatever I can do to get out of town, I will go. Yes. So, uh, they were disappointed when I wasn't running. Cause I think they thought that they were not going to get a trip out of town. Yeah, now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but now that we were, now that we were going to work, you know, we're going to help Ryan, uh, you know, everybody was super excited. And, and one of, you know, one of his pacers or at one of somebody who was going to pace me was then going to pace Ryan but then he got sick. So then I was able to step in and, and take him the last 18 miles to the yeah. finish. And he just, 
I was incredibly impressed with his performance out there. I mean, I think it was a 44% finish rate this year. Yeah, I've heard, I heard it was also brutal, brutal day. Brutal. Super hot. I mean, but, well, thanks for stepping in. I mean, you, you know, sort of picked up the slack for me. I had to work the uh, Broken Arrow Sky Race that weekend and was <laughs> agonizing over the fact that, of course, my great friend and business partner was out slogging through a hundred mile race, but luckily he had a famous rock star there to, <laughs> to pull up, you know, and take him home those last 18 miles. But yeah, fun to entertain the uh, the listening audience. Of course, Ryan is our behind the scenes MVP. He doesn't get nearly enough shine. So when we have an opportunity to do it on the show here, we got to take advantage of it. But yeah, and he, course, he really, he really had it. He really, you know, put an incredible effort on that out on that course. I mean, I, I don't think that if I would have even been at full strength, I would have, I probably would have been part of that, you know, 56% of the people who dropped, honestly, yeah. given how, I mean, it was just carnage out there. Yeah. Well, Ben, it's super fun to have you on the podcast. And I think we have so many different angles that we could go in this conversation. But of course, you are the front man for Death Cab for, for Cutie. And you've got a, a new album coming out here very soon. And I uh, want to talk all about the process of putting that together. But maybe just to start, as we meander down that path, where do you view yourself right now in the arc of your professional career? Um, you know, on the cusp of releasing what I think is your 10th studio album, where are you thinking about yourself in the greater context of your career? I've never been asked that before. That's kind of, that's a very good jumping off point. Um, <laughs> I, th at this point in the band's career, um, I, we are so far past we we have we have so we so long ago eclipsed what I even thought was possible uh, for any band that I would ever have been involved with. Um, when we started this band in the late nineties in nineteen ninety seven in Bellingham, you know our heroes were you know these small independent acts that maybe put out a couple records and they would take six weeks off of work if they could manage it and go on tour when they had a new record and maybe they would go to Europe for a couple of weeks. But, you know, the, the scope of what was even possible was, was infinitesimal compared to where Death Cab has found themselves. So at this point in our career, I'm just feels so grateful that people even still care, honestly. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, I, I don't want to come off, you know, I'm not saying this, you know, attempt to be like overly self-effacing or with like a uh, extreme level of modesty or something like that. But, you know, it, it's been really, it's been really incredible to see that p the music that we've made over the years still has, that is still resonating with people mm -hmm. you know, so that the older music that, you know, the records that are kind of our, you know, our, our, you know, our bigger albums that, you know, they have, continue to be intertwined in people's lives and that, you know, for the most part, a lot of the new music that we're making is still, is still resonating with people, at least those who are fans of the band. So I think the, the deeper I get into my career, the more grateful I am for everything that we've accomplished in a way that I might've taken it for granted when we were just starting out yeah. um, or when, or when, you know, we first got pretty big and, um, and I felt really overwhelmed by, you know, the requests for our time and the amount of touring and people trying to get at us and, and this and that. And, you know, now I'm just, I just feel so grateful that, uh, that we're able to continue doing this, especially, you know, we're in our mid forties now and yeah. so, so many of the bands that we came up with have been broken up for a decade plus, or, you know, people went back to law school or whatever, you know, it's they, funny, you know, I'd love to talk about this too, because Ryan, who I chatted with sort of in preparation for this, conversation mentioned that he spent some time with you guys in studio as you were recording this new album and that he was so impressed with your interpersonal relationships and like how you communicated with one another and made sure that you honored each other's sort of artistic integrity. Um, and so maybe like if you could com comment at all on the relationships and how that's evolved too, because like you said, you're in your mid forties. Now, as we get older relationships change, the way we view ourselves change, what motivates us, what inspires us change. So I'm sure there's some really interesting develop developments and um, evolution there, like on the friendship and the partnership side between the bandmates, anything there you want to expand on? 
Yeah, I, I think that people in their early 20s tend to not be great at communicating with each other. And we certainly were not when we first started out. So I think I think that because we have this like long and rich history together, you know, you know, some people have kind of come and gone from the lineup over the years, but you know, um, I think a lot of it is that we all really love and respect each other. And I think as we've gotten older, we've gotten better at communicating and we've gotten better at not pushing each other's buttons just to push buttons, you know? Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I realize just as I said that I'm not trying to kind of indict all young people at being bad at communicating. I'm sure, I'm sure, uh, you know, you know what you mean, man. I'm sure like, uh, you know, p- young people are probably better at it now than we were then. Um, but you know, I, I think that when, I think over time you realize that everyone is working towards a common goal and the common goal is to make the best record possible with the material that you have in front of you. And, you know, we're human beings. Of course, we all have individual agendas creatively and otherwise. But I think that one thing that we've all gotten really good at over the years is recognizing that um, maybe maybe I don't have the best idea in this particular instance. Maybe someone has a better idea. Maybe somebody has a better direction. And it doesn't, it, it shouldn't be taken as a slight to just at least walk down that road and see, see what kind of, uh, what kind of presents itself. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and some, and sometimes you kind of, you kind of, okay, let's try it your way. And then it, it, it works like gangbusters other times. Yeah. yeah that, I, that idea doesn't work. Maybe we were better off where we started. You know? Yeah. I heard something recently that really resonated with me and that in life, you really have like four or five crucible moments. And it made me kind of want to ask you as you reflected on how you guys got started in Bellingham and you were into these, you know, niche independent acts. What was it like, like, as you guys started to achieve some escape velocity or when Death Cab kind of became a phenomenon? Like, what was it like going from being anonymous, struggling artists to sort of achieving fame? And do you sort of look back at that as being one of those sort of crucible moments in your life? I, I think even before um, we we were on kind of more of a mainstream radar, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking specifically around our record Transatlanticism and then definitely the record Plans that came out in 2005 that was our first major label record and it was kind of a big deal for us and it was, you know, seemingly everywhere for a while, which uh, was kind of an interesting and kind of terrifying uh, period. Uh, even before that, uh, I remember we played a show, a headlining show at the Crocodile Cafe in Seattle, Washington in, I believe it was like December of 1998. And it was a couple months after our first record had come out. And the Crocodile was a place that when I was a teenager, I would get this magazine called The Rocket, which was like a, a weekly music magazine, uh, just a Northwest music magazine, which is a crazy thing to think about now that there was <laughs> yeah. once a time that not only there were music magazines, <laughs> But they were like good business too. Yeah. There, not only that there were music magazines, but there was enough, you know, excitement about that format that you could have one for just your local area. Regional, <laughs> yeah. The regional oh, music. Regional. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I would get this magazine and I would, uh, you know, I'd see the ads for the crocodile and like, oh my God, like so-and-so is playing it. You know, the shirt I'm wearing right now, Teenage Fanco is playing or oh, Super Chunk's playing. Oh my God, my like bands I loved. And, um, and I would dream about playing that place. And we played this show and it was uh, uh, a small show, but sold out at 300 people or something like that. And I remember we came off for, you know, our little like encore break and I just became completely overwhelmed and I kind of broke down in tears. And I just, it was this moment of like, we made it. This is it. This is like, this is the, this is the pivot point where we go from, we're just these like kids from Bellingham who like, made a record and play shows and our friends come and our parents come to see us because they're being supportive to, well, maybe this is a real thing. Maybe, maybe we're a real band. Um, and of course, any band that plays music is a real band, but in the sense that we're now playing to people that are not just our friends and they're paying money to see us play and they're buying the records. And sure, it's, it's you know small potatoes in relation to 
you know, Limp Biscuit or whatever was popular sure. at that time, right? Yeah. But it was this moment of like, maybe this is going to work. Maybe this is, maybe this isn't just going to be like a Bellingham thing. And so that was this moment where, you know, I, and I think we as a band started to realize that, yeah, this, not that we were going to become what we became, but this, this could be something that at least will be, uh, worthy of our time and effort for the And how time. old were you guys at this point? I was 22. So had you ever had like a normal job aside from being a professional musician? I mean, I know music is, I went back and watched the Solomon running video they made about you, which is fantastic, yeah. by the way. Yeah, they did a great job with that. And uh, you say in it that something to the effect of that music had always been kind of the driving force in your life. And you probably always imagined yourself as being a professional musician. Was there any doubt in that path along the way? Uh, well, to answer uh, the first part of the question, I, I, I have a degree in environmental chemistry from Western Washington University. Um, oh, wow. And so I was, I went to- Is that how you ended up in Bellingham? Uh, sort of. I ended up in Bellingham because I knew some people who were a year ahead of me in school and they wanted to start a band and they had just said, you should come up to Bellingham, we'll start a band. And I had applied to University of Washington and a few other schools and Western. And I'd gone up to Bellingham and it, uh, even aside from this, you know, kind of conceptual idea of starting a band, I just loved it up there. It was far enough away from Bremerton, you know, far enough away from home that my parents couldn't just like stop by or something. Yeah. <laughs> and that felt like an important detail at the time. Um, but so I, I ended up getting a degree from Huxley School of Environmental Sciences and uh, Studies at Western. And I was working in a, uh, I worked at a lab doing environmental testing on like wastewater for a, like a, for a refinery up in, in, um, in, in, in uh, Ferndale, which is kind of an odd job. I had gotten it as a and I had interned there in college, and then I worked there for the year after I graduated. So I graduated in 98. The band was making our first record uh, in, called Something About Airplanes for the first six months of 98, off and on at home. And then the record came out in August of 98, and I had taken a job, uh, a contract job at this place, doing the same work. So it was kind of a great job to have in the sense that it paid not a lot of money by adult standards, but by 22 year old, your rent is $250 standards. I was like, I was, I was a millionaire, right? Yeah, of course. Um, and, uh, and it was also the kind of job that because it was it required so much training to get to the point where I was doing this job, I would just, I had them held hostage where I would just leave on tour and say like, Hey, I'm going to be gone for two weeks, uh, here to here. You know, I'm sorry if you have to let me go. I totally understand. But you know, it's going to take you like four months to train somebody up to where I'm at <laughs> yeah. this job. So, you know, I understand if you got to fire me and they're like, just go, just go and come back in two weeks. And, uh, I kind of took advantage of that pretty, uh, pretty blatantly, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I work, I did that for a while. I worked in some labs in Seattle. Uh, when I moved down to Seattle in 99, uh, temp jobs and, and whatnot, I worked for a nonprofit in a warehouse for a year, uh, packaging, shipping and receiving for like a, uh, non-violence curriculum, uh, place that sold that. But like, and, did you always have the belief that music was going to be the thing for you? I mean, cause it feels like obviously it's a competitive industry, right? It's hard to break through, especially when you're living up in the deep Northwest of Bellingham, Washington. Although maybe in those days, it was like kind of a, a great place in which you could mature and hone your craft. I don't know. I'm just curious to, to sort of hear if there was ever a doubt on this journey, as you've said that you've already eclipsed any expectation, any dream you guys could have ever imagined in the early days to hear about any moments of doubt along the way. Well, I guess kind of to back up a little bit and, and clarify uh, that it was always my dream to make a living playing music. But the people that were our heroes and the people we looked up to, they, they were maybe making a little bit of money playing music. And it might, might be the kind of thing that could sustain them for a very active four or five years. Um, you know, kind of not dissimilar to ultra running, honestly. Yeah, yeah. In the sense that like, okay, well, I'm going to 
put a lot of hours into this and a lot of time into it. And I, there was nothing I would love more than to like do this professionally for the rest of my life. But I'm well aware that there is not a lot of money in this particular venture. So that the, the, be, the most I can hope for is that I will be able to do this and make some kind of um, uh, kind of supplemental uh, living doing it for a period of time. And after that period of time, I will have to join the real world in some capacity. So, mm -hmm. you know, in 99, 2000, we were starting to get, in 2000, I remember we got our first royalty check for what seemed like a fortune. It was like $4,000 a person or something, right? Mm -hmm. And given my standard of living at that point, that was enough to get me to through like two or three months, uh, you know, living in like, you know, group how, you know, how, you know, house with other people and whatever else and, you know, eating, you know, like eating ramen or whatever else. Right. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was, a, I quit working at this temp job around that time with the idea of like, okay, well, here we go. Let's see how long I can do this. But it was, n I never had this, uh, thought that I could, this could be a sustained living for me. I just thought that this would be something I would hopefully be able to do uh, and make enough money to survive, maybe pick up temp jobs along the way if I had yeah. to for four or five years, maybe. And then eventually I'd have to go back to grad school or something like that. And that's what's been so interesting to me about, you know, when I started getting into uh, ultra running and kind of learning more about the community, it felt very similar to the early days of being in a punk or an indie, or an indie band, right? Where yeah. there's a little bit of money there, but it's not, it, it's not like you know, 401k money, right? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, so you kind of have to really take advantage of the opportunities that you have in front of you and be able to try to like capitalize on them, uh, in the time that you have this, this window opens up. Right. Yeah. And, you know, f thankfully for me and for our band, like the window never closed back down, but yeah. we were always, we were always expecting that moment where, I mean, to this day, almost, I'm still expecting to like, get a call from the manager and be like, yeah, no, uh, we, we sold three tickets for this entire tour <laughs> yeah, Sorry, over it. You might want to think about uh, career change. Like I'm still almost waiting for that phone call. Wow. That is so fascinating because like, I remember talking to Jim Walmsley in Europe last summer. Actually, I was speaking with his fiance, Jess, soon to be, or actually no, now his wife anyway. And she revealed that she and Jim had had these conversations and Jim and I talked about this publicly on the podcast. So I'm not revealing any, anything that I shouldn't hear, but that he sort of had these doubts of like, she was saying, Oh, we're going to move to Europe now because like Jim's contract comes up like at X date and we want to make sure. And I was like, it's so funny that even Jim Walmsley sort of worries about the security of his contract. And it's similar to you. It's like, I think that's what keeps people sharp and keeps people at the top of their game is to just assume that the end is nigh and that you have to continue to, you know, sharpen your craft and keep yourself at the top of the of your game in order to keep your position and and continue to to be successful. And I want to get around to hearing about how you got into trail running because obviously this is a trail running podcast. But I also think there's a lot of parallels between being a professional musician and and being an athlete in that you probably have good years and bad years. You probably have moments where you have like profound creative inspiration, but also probably times where you feel like you're washed up or you've lost your spark or whatever. So maybe if you could just describe the emotional grind of doing what you do professionally and, and maybe describe a time where you were struggling to find the motivation and, and how you got through it. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a very apt kind of observation in the sense that, you know, keeping it kind of in keeping it between these two worlds that, you know, we're discussing, I, I think of, you know, what would be an, an ultra runner's season is kind of like, uh, that would be an album cycle for me. And for people who are unaware, um, an album cycle is kind of the period in which you're writing the record, you're recording the record, you're releasing it, and then you're touring the album. So this could be a year and a half, two year period, depending on how much touring you're doing, how much, you know, pre-production, how much writing you're doing for the record. And as I look back on my career, I can certainly see places where, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, I can I can pinpoint moments in my career records that I've made that the band has made that I wish I had a second crack at. You know, uh -huh. I, I wish that. But one of the things about 
being a uh, an artist, and I think also to an extent being an athlete, is that what wherever you are in your career, you're dealing with you're dealing with what you have right in front of you, right? You know, as a musician, you're kind of, and a songwriter, you're dealing with, these are the songs that I have in front of me right now. These are the songs I've written for this record. Um, you want every record to be the best record you've ever made, but of course that can't be the case. Some are going to be better than others. The more records that we make, the more records that I've made, um, it's become clear to me, which, you know, it's, it's like a little, you know, the, the, the metaphor of records as children is kind of an off repeated thing um, yeah. in, in circles, uh, music circles, but it is as if like, yeah, you know, sometimes some kids achieve, uh, more than others and you love them all equally, but you can see, you can see their, you know, their strengths and faults. And, uh, so it's, you know, if taking it kind of back into the running world, there's been running seasons I've had where, everything has just been dialed and worked perfectly. And, you know, I haven't had any real lows or doubts. And then I've had those years where you ask yourself, why am I even doing this? Why did I sign up for this event? Why am I here? I'm not good at this. Or, you know, I'm, or I'm injured and I can't do it the way I wanted to do it, or I can't do it at all. Um, and so I think so much of, I think, a lot, I think where the, there are parallels, parallels is that both artists and athletes have to deal with a lot of self-doubt from time to time. Yeah. And, and you don't want to get too high. You don't want to get too low. And you want to just keep metaphorically or literally putting one foot in front of the other yeah. and just get, get to your destination eventually. And after, after you've gotten to your destination, you create a new destination and then you try to get to that one. And, you know, not every race is going to be your, your best race and not every record is going to be your best record and you just have to kind of accept like sometimes you're on a heater sometimes you're not and yeah you know lo the longer the longer a career you know the more the, the more kind of um the wider the picture gets and yeah the wider that kind of um that kind of view of all of your your highs and lows is is more apparent yeah so in talking about not getting too high in the Solomon video that they made about you, you sort of discussed how trail running has been a grounding influence for you and you living this extraordinary life that every kid sort of grows up dreaming about touring the country, being famous, performing in front of thousands of people. And that maybe there was part of you that needed a little humble pie that you found in the trail running community. So if you could expand on that and maybe in doing so sort of paint the picture of your origin story within the sport, I think people would get a kick out of it. Yeah. I, I think one, one of the many things that I love about this sport is that it doesn't leave a lot of room for ego um, in the sense that, you know, someone might go out and have, the best day of their life on the trail, be it in a, on a, in a race or, or what, what have you. And you, you have those moments where you feel invincible and in that, but for every one of those races or periods, you know, you, you, there's a, there's another, there's another point where like you're puking on the side of the trail, right. Or, or like you're just an emotional wreck in the middle of the night in the mountain somewhere and you're cold and you don't know why you even started this thing and you you think you're not good at it. And why am I even out here doing this or whatever? And it, I, I think that, I think that it's one of the many reasons that the overwhelming majority of ultra runners that I've met have been, uh, very kind and, uh, um, humble is because even the greatest runners in the world have found themselves, you know, crying and puking on the side of a trail, probably, right? Yeah. Well, in almost every day you get humbled, you know, like yeah. even in normal training days, you get your ass kicked. It is a uniquely humbling sport, like a life practice and a lifestyle. And I don't think it's a coincidence, right, that the personalities of the people you find within it are often characterized by that humility. Yeah, it, it's it. Humility is almost is like the second thing you learn mm -hmm. <laughs> in the sport, or or one of the first couple of things you learn is that you're it's gonna it's gonna hand you your ass, 
Yeah. And you're going to have to reckon with that. Right. Um, and so as a, as one might imagine, it's a pretty great feeling to stand up in front of thousands of people who are cheering for you and singing your songs back to you. And it, there have been moments in my life where I have been deeply seduced by that mm. and that I have uh, lost perspective on what's important and who I am and uh, where, I, where I've come from. And, uh, and I think I would hope that even without running, I would have, I would have gotten to a place of uh, perspective and humility. But getting involved with this sport has been a, a really necessary and valuable counterweight to the ego highs that being a performer uh, gives me. Um, and also of equal importance is that uh, it, it allows me yet another thing to share with people that is not just the music that I make or uh, who I am as a personality in the greater kind of musical landscape. Mm -hmm. Like if, you know, if there's, if, you know, this doesn't happen super often, but you know, from time to time I'll be at a race and I'll be running with somebody and they'll ask what I do and I'll tell them what I do and who I am. And they'll be like, Oh my God, you know, I love your band or I, I love this song or something like that. And, you know, if somebody comes up to me on the street and is like, um, Hey, you're Ben Gibbard. And I'm like, yes, I am. What we have in common is me. Yeah. Okay. We, ha we have in common is I am me. They recognize me and I am me. So there can be a slightly, uh, um, awkward, sometimes an awkward kind of standoff before, you know, usually I, I'm able to kind of diffuse it and kind of like ask somebody a question about themselves. Like, what are you, who, what is your name? Sure. <laughs> what do you do for a living? Um, but when I'm out on the trail and I run into somebody who recognizes me from the band or I'm on a race or something, um, what we're, what we have in common is this, yeah. we have running in common. We have this, we're both running Cascade Crest yeah. or we're both out in the Olympics at the same time. And to me, that's such, I, I love having that commonality and that, that shared experience with, with people who do not, who, who might know me just from the band, because that allows us to kind of communicate about something that we both love mm -hmm. and, and not just have the fact that I am in a band be the focal point of our interaction, if that makes sense. I'm more than willing to, you know, if you see me, if anybody listening sees me on the trail or is on a race, they want to ask me about songs, by all means, go for it. Like yeah. I'm totally down to do that. But, uh, and you know, so I'm not poo pooing that, but what I'm saying is that it's wonderful to have this thing in common with people that we can, we can share yeah. our experiences and we can talk about, you know, other races we've done or if, have you run this course? Oh, I haven't. Oh, I have. Well, uh, we got a big climb coming up to say, you know, make sure you grab some more water for that. Da, 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 da. It's, it's just such a, it's, I love the fact that I have this activity that takes me out of my identity as merely a musician as a, and a songwriter and allows me to kind of, you know, be with the people, so to speak, in a way that, uh, if I, that I, I, I wouldn't have that if I didn't have, you know, uh, an outlet like this, I don't think. Do you feel that because you are able to get out of your identity as a musician, when you are putting on the identity as a trail runner, that when you get back in the studio, you're able to then put the identity of musician back on and execute maybe, maybe at a higher level because you have that counterweight? I think it's really important for people in general, but, but very much uh, specifically artists to have a place where they can get away from their work. Because when I was younger, I lived in and with my music and music in general 24 seven. Mm -hmm. It was all I cared about. It was all I thought about. It was all I read about. Um, it was all I did. Um, and it, it led me to some kind of neurotic places where I was just obsessing over something I was in the midst of writing that wasn't going particularly well or something as asinine as scene politics or whatever. And it just, it made my world very small. And to have ultra running as this counterweight is important in many ways. We already discussed that it's important as a, a way to kind of remove you know, strip ego out of yourself, but it's also important as a 
place for me to kind of leave my headspace as a writer and just be, you know, in the mountains, on the trails, with friends, most of which who are not musicians, you know, who I'm friends with in this community, mm -hmm. and to have other things to talk about, other things to experience than music in general or the work that I'm specifically working on in that moment. So mm -hmm. that when I come back into my studio where I'm sitting right now, you know, I've, I'm, I'm coming at my work with a fresh perspective. Like everything that's a work in progress, I've, I've walked away from it for, you know, hours or, or days or whatever, and I'm coming back and I'm able to hear things and, uh, that uh, need improvement or that, oh, actually that was pretty good the way it was. I don't, I don't really don't need to mm. mess with that. That can kind of, so it, I think in general, I mean, everybody in life, I think needs, needs an outlet that takes them outside of their own head. But as a writer and as a musician, um, you know, ultra running has been like a, a, an incredibly important. Yeah. It's funny now because I feel like that principle applies to basically every profession, but maybe is heightened in the type of work that you do where you are in the spotlight and where you do need that creative energy. But it is so important to just kind of have hobbies, right? And the same is true for pro athletes. Like if you become so one dimensional in that identity, then if you get injured, your whole life falls apart or, you know, you just limit the ways in which that you can approach the world. Similarly in business, when you have your own thing going on or you're leading a team of people that you become so, you know, single-mindedly focused on one particular thing that ultimately over time it burns you out and you don't perform as well at whatever duty. So it's funny, I've been talking to my brother about this too, of just like how important it is for people to have interests that don't have anything to do with their profession. So something to keep in mind. Well, especially, especially when you, you and I are in professions that are relatively tenuous at best. True. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, there are times where I've lamented to friends, like, I mean, obviously I wouldn't change anything about my life, but you know, if, if someone goes to medical school and becomes a doctor or becomes an accountant or whatever. That's something that for the, for, for all intents and purposes, they can kind of do until they don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. That, you know, for the most part, if you're an accountant, you can do that job until you decide you don't want to do it anymore. But being an athlete or being a musician, you know, there are so many uh, outside factors controlling your destiny in, in that particular discipline, um, that it's, it, it at times feels, it feels like you're kind of tightrope walking through your career, right? Yeah. Yeah. So going back to the analog between being an athlete and an artist, I wonder what it's like in the lead up to an album release, because where you sit now, what are we like six weeks away from the new album? being, uh, you know, coming to market asphalt meadows. And I think this is potentially interesting too, you know, as a pro athlete talking to a pro musician, I imagine that in this final buildup, as you're doing a lot of press and anxiously awaiting, taking this creative baby to use that metaphor and presenting it to the universe that there's maybe like some anxiety or some self-doubt that comes with that whole process. Am I touching on something there that might be accurate or can you explain what the mind space is after you've put all the writing and, and recorded all the songs and put them together in the sequence that you want? All that's left to do is to release it into the universe. What's that like? Where's your mind state at right now? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a very astute observation, Dylan, um, in the sense that one of my, one of the purest um, feelings that I have as a songwriter is when I've finished something in this room that I'm in right now, and I'm listening back to it, and I'm really uh, proud of it, and no one has heard it yet. And I'm just like, and even if, it, and oftentimes it's something that it might not even be any good, but in the moment, I'm just like, I'm so proud. This is, oh, this song is awesome killed the game on this one yes. and you're just excited and you're proud of yourself and you feel like you've done a good day's work. And that feeling is uh, exponentially larger when you've just finished this statement uh, with your bandmates and you've, you know, you've, you've kind of got the sequencing, right. You've got the artwork and the, you know, 
the mixes all sound good and you're listening to it in the car and you know in your studio and in earbuds and you're just kind of walking around and you're vibing on it and you're really proud of it and you can hear all the the months of work that you've put into this uh record and then there's a period in which um no one's heard it yet and you're i'm you know you're talking to people about the record some of which have who've heard some tracks some who've heard the whole thing but you're waiting on this day where it's going to be released into the world and it's going to it's the narrative of what it is and how good it is is going to be determined by everyone who's listening to it and writing about it uh and uh and kind of the knee jerk uh first impressions and opinions that people are spouting out into the world via social media and everything else. And, you know, that's all totally fine. That's all part of living in the 21st century, right? But um, if I have any anxiety around it, it's not so much that I'm, I'm not even anxious. It's more that you break the seal on that kind of like very um, kind of, uh, kind of self-congratulatory time where you're proud of it but no one's heard it yet yeah. and you can it's it's almost like pure you know yeah. because uh because it hasn't entered the world yet uh. um but it's also incredibly rewarding to get the music out and and sometimes you know we've made records that i thought were the greatest thing we've ever done and people have not reacted in that fashion and then we've released songs or made records that i was like yeah hey, we'll see how this goes and then it turns into something that we couldn't have even imagined so, wow. but i think at this point in our career being 25 years in i think i also have to be uh i also try to maintain a sense of uh being realistic about what you know the culture at large um how the culture at large is going to react to a record made by a band of dudes in their mid forties who've been around for 25 years. And mm -hmm. that because we've had, we've made these records in our past that have had these like larger kind of, um, kind of cultural kind of, they've been these kind of, you know, smaller kind of cultural zeitgeist moments, you know, even, even though they were never, we never thought they would be that or, you know, were, they were not intended to be that. Um, it can be difficult to, to kind of be releasing something new with the knowledge and the, the memory of having a death cab record be like more of an event in the culture yeah. than it necessarily is going to be now. And so my expectations for any record we make now is like, I just, I want the record to be the best possible collection of songs that we can put out in that time period. Mm -hmm. And that the record reminds people why they love the band. Yeah. And it might, you know, could this record be someone's favorite death cab record of all time? Of course it could. But I think at the end of the day, I and given the body of work that we've accrued over the years, you know, I I I hope that every record we make is a reminder to people why they love the band. Yeah. It reminds me of being like six weeks out from a hundred mile race and knowing that you've put in so much work and you just want it to go well and you just like yeah. hope that you can put on the type of performance that you know, you think you've sort of built yourself up to a condition to be able to execute against. And I don't know, being somebody who is in the spotlight and whose self identity and profession is wrapped up in the success in the studio, it's similar to an athlete who has a similar thing uh, based on how high they stand on a, a podium at the end of the race. But I'm also curious, like, you know, and now in the final stages of putting the the album together, and then once things are released, do you have like a bit of a come down? Because I guess you won't have much time to do so because you're going to be going on tour here very soon. But, you know, there's that phenomenon like after big races or even after, you know, the Olympics or whatever, where athletes sort of have this post post race blues more or less. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, it's never necessarily like associated with how successful the athlete has done in that competition. It's, it's the process of building up to something and then coming through the other side where you experience a pressure release. And sometimes that's accompanied by a melancholy feeling. Is there something similar that, to that in, in uh, your creative field? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, to, to your point about you know, getting up for a big race, you know, for, I've often found that after I finish, um, like a race that I've been kind of had on the calendar for a long time and 
I'm looking forward to it and putting all the training in and everything. And then, you know, the, if, you know, if all goes well, you finish and you, I, I feel the sense of like, everything is right in the world for like a week. You know, the yeah. news doesn't bother me. You know, when Trump was president, I didn't care what he was saying. I was like, everything's fine, man. And I'm just crushing food. You know, it's like burger and fries and a milkshake. Why not? I just ran a hundred miles. I burned like 12,000 calories. I can eat this. No problem. Yeah. And then, and it's very similar with an album in the sense that you put the record out and you're like, the record's out, guys. We did it. Everything's right in the world. You know, I don't care what's in the news right now. Let's go out for a big dinner and celebrate. And then eventually, as with uh, the time, you know, post a big race, you know, in the same way that maybe 48 hours after 100, I'm already looking on ultra sign up about like, what's the next thing I'm going to sign up? Okay, what am I doing next? You know, there's a similar, uh, there's a similar kind of, uh, kind of like nervous energy that comes up after we finish a record where I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. now I need to start writing the next one. Now, what, you know, you know, what, what should, what, you know, what, what worked with the last one? What didn't work? Uh, what can we build on? Uh, and I often kind of have this like empty nest syndrome in the sense that like I've done so much writing for this record. I think, you know, um, it, it, it doesn't matter how much writing I did if the record is <laughs> unsuccessful, but, you know, I wrote and we wrote, you know, around 90 songs and ideas and things for this record that we kind of chipped down to some stuff that we would record. And yeah. then from that, we chipped it down to the actual uh, sequence of the record. Um, but for all intents and purposes, I, I am, I have no songs right now. I have no new songs. I haven't really started uh, the process of writing a new record because I feel like we need to get this one out and I need to kind of bask in kind of the sense of accomplishment that I got from, from completing it. And then a little bit of time needs to go by and then I can start thinking about what the next record is going to be. And I think that very similar to how we build our calendars as ultra runners, we're, we're building a calendar for the year. And then as soon as that, the last race is done, we're already thinking about yeah. what we're going to do next year. And it's, it's very similar, you know, as a songwriter. Yeah. So tell us about the album. Of course, you guys have been together for 25 years, more or less. And uh, you've done a lot. There's a lot of things that you're already proud of. In what ways is this an extension of what people have come to expect from Death Cab? And in what ways is, is it different? Well, I think one of the hardest things to do as one gets deeper into their career uh, as a band or as an artist is to maintain uh, elements of the music that are signature to what you do while also trying to kind of push forward and, and bring in new elements and new ideas. Um, because, you know, if it would be very easy, it would be easier to make a completely different sounding record every time that would be that would be an easy thing to do because in that sense um you would be basically killing your own legacy not kill eh, like that's not the right way of putting it um you would basically be cutting bait with everything you had done before that point with every record mm. but as someone who is first and foremost a music fan what i love about my favorite bands and what i love about artists who've kind of been doing it as long as we have or longer is that, you know, there are going to be successes and failures throughout any artist's discography, but that when you listen through, say like Neil Young's discography, which is massive at this point, mm -hmm. you know, there are records that are amazing. There are records that are not so great, but you can always, you can always kind of, Neil Young is always in there, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can always see, you can almost hear the wheels turning. You can, you know, if you listen to something, uh, you know, from kind of an, an, an odd electronic period, you can see like, okay, I, I see what this guy's going for right here. It's not my favorite thing they've done, but I, but I know with the benefit of hindsight, I can, I can, I know what records are coming next. Mm -hmm. Right. So I can, you can see people kind of stray off of their path and come back to it. And 
So for us, one of the things I'm the most proud about with this record is that for the first time, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a very real way, um, we were writing together a lot more than we had in, in, on past records in the sense that, um, I kind of came up with this songwriting exercise early in lockdown, uh, just out of boredom and, and, and wanting to kind of mix things up in the sense that, so there's five of us in the band and there are five days in a work week, right? So normally I'll sit in this room and write songs and then just upload them to a Dropbox and the band will pull them down and you know, they might say like, hey, give me the guitars for that or I want to try something new. They might mess around with my demos, but mm -hmm. that's how we've almost always done it. And so I came up with this idea of, okay, well, there's five of us. Let's kind of every week create an out of order order. And on Monday, say Nick, our bass player, will write a bass line and then upload it to a Dropbox. The next day on Tuesday, Zach, our keyboard player, might pull it, he'll pull it down. He'll add some keyboards, something to it, and then put it back up. I pull it down Wednesday. I add vocals, write a melody lyrics, you know, put it back up, so on and so forth till Friday. And at the end of the week, we have a song. But the rules were that whomever has the piece of music has 24 hours to add their stuff and upload it and, and no slacking, like, no, like, oh, I didn't get around to it. It's like, if yeah. Wednesday is your day, you have to, you have to get it done. Yeah, yeah. And while you have it, you have complete editorial control over the process. So something that on Monday started sounding like Octune Baby U2, by Friday, it might sound like Massive Attack because, yes. you know, everybody who had the music had complete control over, over where it was going. And, you know, it, was, it wasn't always successful, but the moments that it was the most successful were the moments where I was not going first. So I wasn't setting the harmonic and melodic um, kind of tone for the rest of the week. Because, every, because my hands tend to go to similar places on an instrument. Oh. I'm, I'm making similar shapes on the guitar or the piano. I'm playing in similar keys. I'm writing similar melodies. But if Zach, our keyboard player, writes this kind of angular piano piece, and then four days later I'm getting something that is completely different than anything I would have written myself, well, that's going to take, you know, that's going to allow me to write melodies that are different than I would normally write. And often because of the sonic palette of what I'm listening to, which is something that I did not initially create, the imagery that's coming into my mind is very different than if I'm sitting down with an acoustic guitar trying to write something. Mm. So a good, you know, almost half, maybe even a little more of the record had its origins in that, uh, in that writing kind of style. And it was, you know, it, it was something that we kind of thought we'd try for a bit just to see if it, my is this originated it. during lockdown or is this a yeah. process that, oh, wow. Yeah. So, so, you know, you know, during, obviously in the beginning of the lockdown, everybody was freaked out and thought we were going to be in our houses for two weeks or something mm -hmm. and then get back to normal life or whatever. Right. And as the months kind of dragged on, um, and it became apparent that this was going to be kind of how things were for a while, uh, I really wanted to kind of stay engaged with my bandmates because we couldn't be in the same room together. You know, right. we live in four different cities. A couple of us have kids who were going to school or daycare. And, you know, obviously it was, as we all remember at that time, at least, you know, certainly in Seattle, um, you know, that was kind of, you know, we were like outside, you know, like, you know, around like space heaters, right? Hanging out with our friends in like jackets, you know, because oh. everybody was terrified of, um, you know, getting COVID. So uh, we, there, we, it was just impossible for us to be in the same room. But you know, the technology has advanced to such an extent where it wasn't necessary to be in the same room to, to create together. Yeah. So it'll have a, a different feel probably based on just the different process. And uh, yeah, that's probably a good thing for a team of people to sort of learn to work together in a, in a new and creative way. It probably keeps things fresh, um, you know, on album number 10. So you're going to be going on tour as soon as this thing is released. If not, actually, I think the tour starts before the album is released. The album's released on September 16th. I yes. believe you guys start your tour, uh, what, shortly thereafter? 
Yeah, I think we're starting in, officially starting in Madison on the 20th or something like that. Okay, cool. So maybe uh, talk about how the the tour lifestyle too, as we begin to to wind down. I feel like I could spend all afternoon with you, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. But I, I would love to hear sort of like what that lifestyle is like, but also just kind of like how running fits in with the tour lifestyle and 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 in what benefit it brings to what I'm sure is a fun though hectic couple of months on the road like how does running act as the counterbalance for you in that context it's it's become an incredibly important part of uh the touring experience for me in in multiple ways uh you know in in one way i it's i i sometimes call it speed tourism um, because, you know, if, if, we're, if we're playing in Paris or something like that, and I, I want to go for like a long run, I'm like, I'm just going to go run around Paris and just see a bunch of stuff yeah. that I wouldn't see if I was walking or in a car or in the, in the metro or whatever. Um, and I think there's also, I've, I often find that I play, I play more high, it almost seems counterintuitive, but I play more high energy more um, kind of sustained, uh, my energy levels are sustained better when I, when I, uh, the day that I'm doing like a long run or something yeah, like that. Because yeah. often, um, you know, you know, at this point I've been training for ultras like often on the road and there's days where like, I guess I'm doing a five hour run and then getting to sound check just in time to do sound check or something, right? Yeah. And, you know, on varying terrain, sometimes you get lucky and, you know, you're playing in Nashville and Percy Warner Park is just down the street and they've got pretty cool trails in there. And you can kind of like get some actual, you know, a little bit of vert or something like that. But then yeah. sometimes you're like, oh, I'm in Grand Rapids and I guess I'm just running this bike path in 90 degree weather, 80 percent humidity <laughs> for three hours, which I did a couple of weeks ago. Right. Um but, um, yeah, I just find like getting your heart rate up and kind of getting the blood flowing earlier in the day makes it feel like you're not being shot out of a cannon when you hop on stage. Yeah. It's funny. Cause Ryan mentioned, and it, I think this is accurate, but correct me if I'm wrong, but he said that the days that he was in studio with you guys, you did like four hour runs in the morning before getting to the studio at like 9 AM and then recorded <laughs> all day. So there is a, an energizing component to your run training that probably helps cleanse the palate or, you know, get the creative juices flowing before you get on stage or before you get in the studio. Well, yeah. And it's also very important to note that at the level we're at now, we don't have to like set up the gear or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. And we have a tour bus. So often on tour, if I'm going to do a long run, you know, I'll come back, clean up and then take a nap on the bus for an hour or something like that. Right. Or, yeah. You know, when, when Ryan was in the studio with us, you know, I would leave, you know, I would leave our house on Capitol Hill at like 5 a.m. and like run to Discovery Park and like run a couple hours in Discovery and then time it so that I was getting to the studio, which thankfully had like a, a bathroom with a shower. I would leave clothes there the night before. So I would just run to the studio and get there as the other guys are pulling up in their cars. Yeah. And like, you know, I'd leave a change of clothes and everything there the night before. So I'd like, okay, guys, I'm going to hop in the shower and then I'll, uh, I'll be in the studio in like 10 minutes. And then eventually classic run commute there. Exactly. And then, and then, you know, which is not dissimilar from what a lot of people have do. Right. So it's not, you know, it's, it it feels like, uh, maybe a little bit more glamorous, but it's not, it's not dissimilar to somebody running to work and using the shower in the gym or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Going sitting in the office all day. Awesome. So Ben, before I let you go, I have to make you tell a story here on the podcast because I had Yassin Daboon on the show a while back and he related a story about ceremoniously smoking his last cigarette while listening to Pearl Jam. And he told me (laughs) that after that podcast went live that you sent him a message and told him that you had a similar story about cigarettes and Pearl Jam. I'm wondering if you maybe want to tell that story here on the podcast because it's quite entertaining. <laughs> of course I will. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, not, not to, not to one up, uh, Yassine's stories. I, although I, I feel like I am big top on him a little bit of this one. Um, so in, we were on tour with Pearl Jam in 2004. Uh, we were doing this tour uh, called the vote for change tour. And it was this kind of, uh, 
a series of, of packages that were traveling around swing states uh, during in, around election time. So this was like October, I think, of 2004. And so, you know, on one day we would be opening for Pearl Jam in Ohio and that, you know, in like Columbus. And then uh, Bruce Springsteen was playing in Cincinnati and so on and so forth. There were all these like, you know, kind of legacy acts all doing these, all doing a concert in a swing state on the same day. And the idea, of course, was voter registration and, and um, political activism. Uh, so, so I used to be a very heavy drinker and, uh, and smoker. And for whatever reason, which is still unclear to me, in 2004, I decided to start smoking again after not smoking for three years. For, I, for reasons I'm still unclear as to why. But I was like, that, you know what? You know what I, it's been three years. I should start smoking again. That would be a good thing to do. And, 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 I, and I did. And uh, we, we found our, we were on tour with Pearl Jam and we were opening for them. So there was just a lot of time on our hands, just a lot of time sitting around a venue. They weren't our shows. So, you know, we, we weren't playing much longer than 40 minutes. And so it was just a lot of downtime. And I was really smoking a lot, just killing time. And um, eventually my voice started to, I started to f realize I didn't have the lung capacity that I really needed to sing and was getting winded. And I was like, this is stupid. Why did I start doing this again? This is such a, this is such a disgusting habit. And so, you know, a week into the tour, I just quit cold turkey. So we've, it's the, there is an after party after the last show that we have played with Pearl Jam. And it's at this hotel in Florida where we were playing. Um, and, uh, and, you know, guys from Pearl Jam are there. They're all wonderful dudes, awesome people and their crew and one of the other opening bands. And we're all drinking and partying and whatnot. And, uh, and, and Ed, uh, Eddie Vedder um, comes up to me. He's like, hey, Ben, come have a cigarette with me. And I'm like, uh, oh, sorry, man, I quit like a week ago. And Ed goes, don't give me that shit. Come have a cigarette with me. And I'm like, okay, because I'm just <laughs> 27, 28 years old. And yeah. I'm just, and I'm, this, is my, legend. Yeah, yeah. My, this is a legend. This is one of my <laughs> idols. I'm like, okay. So I, I go outside and a week after, quote unquote, quitting smoking, yeah. I smoke a cigarette with Ed. And I realize in that moment that that was going to be my last cigarette because if I smoke another cigarette after this cigarette that I just smoked with Ed, that will no longer, I will not, I will no longer be able to say that I smoked my last cigarette with Eddie Vedder. So <laughs> that was, the, that was the motivation that I had, you know, when I start getting the cravings again in the, in the days and weeks after that cigarette, I would tell myself, well, look, man, if you, you could smoke another cigarette, but then that will not be. It'll ruin life. the story. It'll ruin the story. <laughs> so, you know, my, my desire for a, like a, a, like a, like a, a good narrative, um, kind of was able to, you know, stave off the cravings for a while. Yeah. What a great story. And no doubt it's paid dividends for your athletic career, your ultra running <laughs> I would hope so. performances <laughs> to, to lay off the cigs. But, uh, well, yeah, Ben, it's been great to, to chat with you and, um, you know, I wish you guys nothing but success with the new album and with the, uh, the tour, maybe as we sign off here, tell people where they can find out more about, both the album itself and where they might be able to see you guys live. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, we're not hard to find on social media. Um, you know, deathcabforcutie.com. I think it's at deathcabforcutie for all the socials. So yeah, if you guys are interested um, in finding out if we're playing in your town, uh, by all means, go check that out. And uh, yeah, and if you, if you see me on the trail or at a race or something like that, just come on, come on up and say hi, ask me whatever you want. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, well, uh, thanks so much for coming on, uh, on the pod. Maybe, uh, maybe we can rip some, of section J the PCT together later in the summer. And then Ryan and I were talking about coming to one of those closing shows to end the tour in late October in oh, Seattle, yeah. your home. Absolutely. So, yeah. You should come up, man. You're, you're more than welcome. Yeah. And I think I might, we can catch a run beforehand. We'll get you. Nice there we go. Yeah. Well, yeah. Energized. We'll, we'll go 
Yeah, exactly. We'll go out and hit. We'll go out uh, hit. If it's not, if it's not, everything's not snowed in yet. We can go and uh, hit some hit some cool shit in the Cascades. I think I might be. Are you going to be in Chamonix? Are you going to be out there? I'm not. No, not no. Okay. My my wife is nine and a half months pregnant right now, so we're uh, uh, hunkered okay. down, <laughs> wait, waiting for baby and and uh, missing out this year. But we'll be there in spirit. All righty. Well, it was wonderful talking to you, Dylan. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, getting some trail time with you at some point. Yeah. Likewise, Ben.